If I may, just ask for your uh, attention for just a moment. Um, I'd like to mark um, the recent passing of the, of the Director of Women's Studies at Texas Tech University, who served in that capacity for over 14 years, Dr. Gwen Sorrell. And if I could have just a, a very brief moment of reflection from you about the importance that she had for our community and for Texas Tech University, I would be grateful. You should all know that there is an endowed scholarship in Dr. Sorrell's name, which rests with the Women's Studies program at Texas Tech. Um, if you are interested, as the family has asked, uh, for any uh, expressions of memorial interest and remembrance to be made, if you care to, please contact Texas Tech's Institutional Development Office, which I now gather is called Institutional Advancement, um, or us at Women's Studies. You can certainly call me at any point if you care to. This is the concluding event in what is for us a very special time. This is the 25th anniversary of the annual conference held by the Women's Studies Program. That is, for 25 years, the university has sponsored, has spent money to bring women and men together to discuss issues of commonality, issues of difference, and how to moderate those differences in, in, in intellectual and collegial ways. And it's it's something of a special moment, and that in part explains why we've brought such a special speaker to, to Lubbock this afternoon. Um, however, let me speak a little bit about the, the conference, which has, of, of which this speech is actually the, the concluding event. Um, we had a terrific response. We had participants from New Mexico, from all throughout the state of Texas, from uh, Angelo State, our sister institution, um, we're, we're very, very pleased at, at all of the participation, all of the interest that was shown, and we're very grateful for it, and we hope to double it and make it even bigger next year. Um, there, there is, in con conjunction with the con conference, a series of awards that we make through the generosity of the Women's Studies Community Connection, a group which Gwen Sorrell co-founded in the 1990s. And the Women's Studies Community Connection has, for a number of years, um, supported our program to the extent of funding best paper prizes in both the graduate and undergraduate categories at the conference. And I would like to just take a moment now to let you know the winners of those uh, competitions. The undergraduate winner, who I, I'm, I'm not sure is here, um, but I hope so. And if you'll just hold your applause, there are a couple of winners I'd like to make, their, uh, make an announcement. The undergraduate winner is Catherine Joseph for her paper, The Ronnie John C. This, this paper showed the redefining process of the voices of motherhood in the changing world of India during its struggle for independence. There was a graduate paper which uh, was awarded best paper in that category, the author Aaron, Aaron D. Murphy, and the title of her winning paper was Scripting Fe Feminine Sexual Dysfunction, Exploring the Need for Clinical Reformation of Language. There's also a special prize given this year only, as it's the 25th anniversary, and uh, that is a special honorable mention for, a prize, for, for one of the submissions that we had. That honorable mention goes to Ms. Chloe Willett for her poster, Wonder Woman. Chloe is uh, in the second grade at Roscoe Wilson School. <laughs> and today is her birthday. <laughs> How fun is that? There are a lot of people who have made this afternoon's uh, presentation possible, and m many of them are uh, with the university. And I would just like to very quickly let you know how much space the Women's Studies program takes up on campus. And one of the ways I can let you know that is by telling you how broadly we were able to uh, bring this program to the attention of deans and administrators and get a, a positive response from them in terms of helping us to manage to put the program together and to bring uh, Gloria Steinem to Lubbock. Those, those people, and this is not a full list, but those people include Dr. Guy Bailey, the president of Texas Tech University, the members of the office of the president, including Grace Hernandez, uh, Dr. Jane Weiner, uh, Dean Emeritus, Dr. Robert Stewart, interim senior vice provost, Dr. Matt Baker, dean of the College of Outreach and Distance Education, 
Dr. John Burns, the Dean of the College of Agricultural Science and Natural Resources. Dr. Carol Edwards, who is the Dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts. Dr. Pamela Ibeck, the Dean of the College of Engineering. Um, uh, Dr. Kitty Harris-Wilkes, the Director of the Center for the Study of Addiction and Recovery. Dr. Linda Hoover, the Dean of the College of Human Sciences. General Walter Huffman, U.S. Army retired, Dean of the School of Law. Dr. Juan Munoz, Vice President head of the Office of Institutional Diversity and Community Engagement, and also Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs. Dr. Lawrence Skovenik, the Interim Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And Dr. Michael Schonrock, who is Vice President for Student Affairs. All of those people and all of those offices help support this moment. And if you would join me in thanking them, I would be most grateful. We also have an extraordinary program committee this, this year. That is the people who put it together. Um, I really didn't do very much at all since I'm this, just the director and I sit up in my office and direct. But the people who actually did the work include uh, Dr. Christina Ashby Martin. Um, I'm skipping myself now because these are in alphabetical order. Dr. Lynn Falwell, um, Carol Fukiger from the School of Art, Dr. Jennifer Sneed, Dr. Richard Verone and most especially the coordinator of the Women's Studies program, Tricia Earle. I have the pleasure now of, of introducing um, one, of the most, one of the most senior members of the University Administration who will welcome Gloria Steinem to Lubbock and to Texas Tech University on, a, on my behalf and on behalf of the program committee. Dr. Jane Weiner joined the faculty of Texas Tech's APA accredited, accredited counseling psychology program in 1975. Think about that for a minute. Where were you in 75? I'm not. <clears throat> she taught and conducted research and service in vocational psychology broadly construed and achieved the rank of full professor in 1986. She has held administrative positions at Texas Tech University in the Department of Psychology and in the College of Arts and Sciences, serving as dean for 17 years. From September 2008 until February 2009, she also served the institution as interim provost and senior vice president for academic affairs. In March, just recently, she was appointed to the position of special assistant to the president, and on the 6th of March, the Board of Regents granted her the designation of Dean Emeritus. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jane Weiner. Thank you, Dr. Calkins, for your kind remarks and for giving me the privilege of welcoming and introducing our keynote speaker. First, on behalf of Texas Tech University, I would like to welcome our distinguished guest. Yesterday and today, we have enjoyed the 25th Annual Conference presented by a program that would not exist were it not for the influence and inspiration of this icon of the modern women's movement. Second, the academic credentials. Our speaker is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Smith College, a published author of four going on five books, one long-lived magazine, and has received numerous awards, including the Emmy and induction into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Her work has had national and global impact in advancing workplace dignity and equality for women, and through the 1977 National Conference on Women, developing federal attention to and funding of a national agenda for gender equality in employment, housing, compensation, child support, and other issues. Third, our conference is celebrating women across generations, and we are fortunate to have with us the best known living social justice advocate from the early years of the modern women's movement and other social equity campaigns. In 1972, when our honored guest founded Ms. Magazine, Dr. Calkins was a young child 
looking for a strong woman role model and found her in our guest. The parents of our earlier speaker, Shelby Knox, were just kids then too. I was a graduate student in a nationally accredited, uh, accredited doctoral program with no women regular faculty, where it was generally known that a professor had beaten a female graduate student in the parking lot, and that spent four one hundredths percent of its enormous athletic budget on women's athletics, but where I at least had been accepted. One of my undergraduate roommates, with grades and scores similar to mine, had been rejected by another university because they had never admitted a female graduate student in her field and did not intend to begin with her. But this state of affairs was accepted because, after all, women were to love and be loved, and what did education and work have to do with that? As a graduate student several decades ago in a field that deals with both love and work, I then looked at our speaker's contributions with admiration from afar. She helped me crystallize a concept that I had vaguely felt, that is, love without respect is not love. Love may or may not be necessary to life. But even if it is, it is not sufficient without respect. It is an honor to introduce our speaker, Gloria Steinem. Well, are we going to have a good time this afternoon, or what? <laughs> Who says Lubbock is a conservative place? <laughs> um, thanks to uh, all of the care and thoughtfulness and hard work that has gone into making this conference. Thanks to pioneers like Jane, who's introduction I found very, very moving. Right? Thanks to the generosity of spirit uh, that each of you has shown in taking time out of your busy lives to come here uh, and take a chance on a stranger. It walks, it talks, it's a feminist. <laughs> we have uh, something very special, which is a little more than an hour together in this room and a combination of people that has never happened before in exactly this way and can never happen again in exactly this way. And each one of us is a combination of heredity and environment that is unique too. It never could have happened before and that's the unique person inside each of us. So here's my plan. Uh, if all goes well, I hope that we can leave this room, each of us, me included, with one new piece of information, one new feeling of support, one new organizing tactic, one new subversive announcement of the next meeting. That's <laughs> going to um, and in order to make that happen, we need to use the communal wisdom that is in this room. So my hope is that during what is usually called the question and answer period, uh, we will try to pretend we're sitting in a circle and we can see each other's faces. Uh, after all, I know because of our numbers, we have to sit this way, but this is a hierarchical structure with people looking at each other's backs and me looking at you. Hierarchy is based on patriarchy. Patriarchy doesn't work anywhere anymore, including in this room. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I hope very much that you won't feel uh, confined even to asking questions, that you will give us answers. We certainly could all use some answers, and that we can pool some of the great knowledge and the hearts and minds 
that are here for this short period of time. Um, and incidentally, if there's something you want to call attention to in this community that you'd rather not stand up and say, pass me a note, I'll read anything, I'm leaving early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and perhaps together <clears throat> we can um, begin what I know Shelby Knox uh, called for this morning, which is a community-wide dialogue that will help to free us all and allow us to be the unique individuals we, we truly are. Um, I suppose in some ways this uh, is an effort, the whole, all social justice movements are an effort to redefine politics. You know, politics have been defined as just what happens in the ballot box and the rest of it is uh, cultural or social. Actually, I think sometimes what happens to men is defined as politics and what happens to women is culture. It's a way of saying you can't change that, that's culture, you know. But the fact is that what we are here to talk about is, is quite visible. If you think about this campus uh, and you see more male human beings in uh, engineering courses and more female human beings in the School of the Arts or in communication or in education, that's politics. And if you go into um, uh, a store of some kind and you see that women are selling men's underwear and men are selling kitchen ranges, let's face it, this is not about expertise, it's about commission. <laughs> so it's about politics. If you see one kind of human being in the, port, in the boardroom and another kind of human being uh, at the desk doing the clerical work, um, that's politics, because we have, in each of us, all human talents. I, I was thinking when Jane was talking about the past that uh, my uh, generation was suppo were supposed to be typists because it was, I bet there are other people here who, is this still going on even in spite of computers? That we were supposed to have smaller fingers and special uh, skills and, you know, naturally men couldn't type. Uh, and in rebellion, I, I refused to learn how to type, which has penalized me ever since. <laughs> but the amazing thing was that the moment that computers came along, men could type. So I just want to suggest to you <laughs> that everything is changeable <laughs> and that we, we all have all the, the, the human qualities. But wherever we come from today, whether we are in our fifth stage of burnout already, as some of you probably are, whether you are coming to hear a feminist speaker for the very first time, we all come from, uh, we all come, we're coming together at a particular time in history. We share this. And this really is the sort of middle of the second wave of feminism in this country. So perhaps it's important to remind ourselves of that because one of the ways, first of all, that it's only the middle, you know, uh, the same folks who were telling me uh, a few decades ago that the women's movement wasn't necessary, it was against nature, uh, their wives were not interested, it was, are now saying, well, it used to be necessary, but it's not anymore. So the way, <laughs> the mode that, it, that um, uh, resistance takes now, that obstruction takes now, is to say it used to be necessary. So maybe by placing ourselves in history, we will understand that if it took a century to gain a legal identity as human beings for women of all races and men of color, every one of whom was ownable before, like a table or a chair, when slaves were brought to this country, the, uh, the, their legal status was uh, that of wives because everybody was chattel, right? The same laws were used. So if it took us at least a century to gain a legal identity as citizens and human beings, and we are now striving for legal and social equality, and we're only 34 years into it. I figure, I mean, I don't know how to break this to you, but I figure we have at least 50 years, maybe 60 years to go <laughs> in this wave. Uh, and probably there will be 
other waves in the future before we have cultures that do not sort people by the single element of sex or race or ethnicity or class or sexuality. Each of those things is important and precious, but it's one of a billion things that goes into us as unique people. It's as if you, someone had arbitrarily taken all of the human qualities, the full circle of human qualities, and assigned two-thirds to be masculine and one-third to be feminine. The truth is we all have all human qualities. It makes sense that, that women are on the forefront of this particular revolution, women of all races and ethnicities and sexualities and groups, because we are more confined. We are losing two-thirds of human qualities, or we are being talked out of or pressured out of them by society. But men are losing part of their full humanity, too. And so we all have our whole selves to gain. And the truth of the matter is that there is more difference between two unique individuals, who, two women, two men, two people of the same race or ethnicity. And race, of course, is a fiction. I mean, it, it's, it was a minor adaptation to climate. There is no such thing as, as race in actual fact. But if you, if, you, if you take the few differences there are, having to do with reproduction when it comes to sex, which of course we hope is chosen, freely chosen now, not imposed, uh, or what, if it comes to resistance or vulnerability to certain diseases when it comes to different ethnic groups because of the adaptation to climate, those, those differences are far, far, far less than the differences between two members of the same group. So what we're trying to do is get rid of the labels, free ourselves, and we all have a stake in, in gaining our, our full humanity. Um, I think to, we get a glimpse of what's missing because now we have, or what we have been missing, because now we have women's studies and African-American studies and Native American studies and gay and lesbian studies and, and uh, everything that should really be called remedial studies. <laughs> because, wait a minute, you know, we, how about human history? I mean, why do we learn um, more about some Bourbon kings than we do about what the majority of folks in that culture we're actually doing? Why do we still learn much more about Europe than we do about Africa uh, or about Asia? I mean, it's, it's profoundly political, the, the, the ways in which we study. So we desperately, all of us desperately need these kinds of, of uh, remedial studies in order to have a, um, a picture that is accurate, that looks at the world as it really exists and that allows us to be whole human beings. But I think this past election has uh, given us a glimpse, just a bare glimpse of what we've been missing. By being able to see Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, uh, and for that matter, Sarah Palin. I mean, we have to defend the equality includes the right to be wrong. <laughs> But if we, if, if now that we have seen them, now that their, that their competence and courage and, and expertise and, you know, all the, I mean, you know, just they have changed the molecules in the air, don't you think? Just, okay, so what that tells us is what we have been missing. Do you realize that up to now we have been choosing our national leadership from 6% of the population? We figured it out once, we, you know, we eliminated first all the women and then all the people of color and then all the people who hadn't been able to purchase an advance, I don't know, we ended up with 6% and we hadn't even started on inherited wealth yet. <laughs> so I, I, I hope and believe that this election will uh, not, as, as much as some people are trying to say, the same people who are saying the women's movement is over, we don't need it anymore, are saying, well, now that we have a, a, an African-American president, the movement is over. Uh-uh, it's just the beginning. 
just the beginning. We are just beginning to glimpse what it is that, that we have been missing. And I think it's, it's kind of fun to, um, to look at, um, especially because we've just had Black History Month and we've had Women's History Month and I guess all the other months are white guys' months, but someday. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, it, but they're useful, though, because, they, they, because you learn things. And when every time you learn something new, you know, it, it, you're, it, it's exciting and interesting and also angering. How come they never told us this? You know, I have a button that says, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. It's my... <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought I'd give us some random samples to just, you know, just uh, whet our appetites. Um, uh, for, uh, for instance, um, Mozart had a sister. Now, are we learning this yet? I'm always hoping that everybody will rise up and say, oh, we knew that already. But anyway, Mozart had an older sister named Nenerol. They were both prodigies, child prodigies, who's, who were taken through Europe to perform by their father. Uh, and uh, we, she was sent home to marry, uh, and she became a music teacher. We only know about her, really, because they were so close, the brother and sister, having you know, been uh, really on their own as performers all of their childhoods, that uh, Mozart kept writing to her. And there's a collection of letters called Dear Horseface, because that's what he called her. <laughs> and, that's, and that's how we know about her. But what's interesting is that in them, he says, she was the talented one. So who are we losing, you know? Who right now, who are the, the great female composers who are singing lullabies? And the great male composers who are not singing lullabies and who are therefore you know, missing a whole human experience? Who are the great uh, novelists who are writing in their diaries? You know, if, if we can take what we don't know about history and use to question the present, then I think we will have really uh, become educated and used education in the best way. Think about the space program. I believe we still think that Sally Ride was the first female astronaut, right? Uh, wrong. I mean, there were women who passed the test in the very first class of astronauts uh, with John Glenn and were not only well qualified to be astronauts, but probably would have saved us a lot of money on the per pound cost of thrust. <laughs> <laughs> and they were washed out just because they were females. One of them, Jane Hart, was married to a senator, and so she, she was a helicopter pilot, and she managed to get a hearing, a uh, congressional hearing, on why uh, they had been washed out. And the answer was simply because they were females. Someday in the future, somebody said, I think actually John Glenn said this in the testimony, someday in the future, perhaps in very long flights in space, we will need women for the uh, usual purposes. <laughs> I'm sure he's changed by now. <laughs> um, but, you know, and those women, those women were pioneers and adventurers and explorers, and they were turned out of the space program, and they kept trying to do what they were born to do. One of them, on her own, collect, spent the rest of her life collecting money from uh, just the community where she lived, and buying medical supplies, and flying medical supplies in a single engine plane up the Amazon River in Brazil to uh, aid tribal groups that uh, you know, had no other contact. Two of the other ones went around the world in a rowboat or something. I don't know. You know, they, they were trying to be the explorers they were meant to be. Um, I think that we, we probably know more about some people now because of the combination of, of black history and women's history. We know who Ella Baker is, right? No? Ella Baker was a great uh, civil rights leader. She was the um, person who helped students start SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, there are several good biographies of her, which I recommend. 
But the point is that she trained Martin Luther King. We know who Martin Luther King is, and I'm very grateful that we do. But how come we don't know Ella Baker? There's actually a stamp of, of her now. So, I mean, you know, things are getting better. But in this room, we still know Martin Luther King much better than, than Ella Baker. And I think that the, um, the, the purpose sometimes, as much as I would like to think it's simple forgetfulness or something, sometimes the purpose is really to submerge uh, rebellion uh, in order to keep it from happening again. And we can see that, for instance, with the slave rebellions. There were dozens of slave rebellions. And, they, and quite consciously at the time, people, the, the, in the courts and in the newspapers, people said, we must not write about this because otherwise people will catch this disease. So really the only one we know is Nat Turner. Uh, and that uh, has become the symbol as if it were the only one. And even so, in, in William Styron's book about Nat Turner, his, his novelized, fictionalized version, uh, the motivation he gives him is not political but sexual, as if he really was rebelling because he was interested in the blonde woman who lived next door. Excuse me? I don't think so. Maybe Bill Styron was interested in the blonde woman. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's it, the, the, the kinds of, of, uh, of history we read are so political. But the, the, the biggest one to me, I must say, uh, is the suppression of the history of this country before Europeans showed up. I mean, that is huge, huge. Because we don't learn that there was, for instance, a settlement the size of London in the Middle West before Europeans came. We don't learn that the Iroquois Confederacy and those, the structure, the seven nations, which still have, to this day, a parliament, a, a representative Parliament, which is the oldest uh, continuous democratic parliament on earth. Uh, we don't learn that the native cultures were the uh, A and perhaps the inspiration for the suffrage movement because women were equal within them, controlled their own fertility, decided when and whether to have children. The cultures were matrilineal. Some Times chiefs were female, usually they were male, but if they were male, they were chose, chosen by the female elders. You know, we don't, it was, it was the sight of these cultures um, uh, by European women who came here at the low point of, of any kind of glimpse of equality in, in Europe. Who, who were chattel, as we've already seen, who were owned, um, at a t and, and at a time in, in which in Europe they thought that even criminality was inherited. I mean, it was the peak of a hierarchical view of the world. They had no rights. Where did they suddenly get the idea that women could be equal? And the answer seems to be from the native nations that were still visible. They weren't on, put on reservations until the 1900s. People still went to the same little general store and could see each other. The suffragists had dinner every Sunday night with um, uh, native women in upstate New York. You can, you can read descriptions of them sitting there in their hoop skirts and corsets that were so tight that they fainted and you, they had to take smelling salts with them, right? And they're sitting next to Seneca women in nice chamois tunics and comfortable trousers, beautifully beaded, and so well, it's, you know, <laughs> that's, that's um, where the bloomer costume came from. And not only that, but those women uh, completely, as, as was true in most of the original cultures that we know about, understood how to control their own fertility through the use of herbs and abortifacients, the, patriarchal idea that women were the means of production to be controlled by men hadn't come along yet. So, you know, I mean, this is, did we, did anybody here learn this, that, that the Native American cultures were an inspiration for the suffrage movement and the main part of the Underground Railway, too, because they had territory and because they were not believers in race, uh, racial difference, they just 
if you if you believed in the way, you know, if you behaved well, then they adopted you. You know, it was a great uh, custom in native cultures to adopt people and give them a native name. It's probably why we see so many families who who have a shared heritage through intermarriage of African American descent and Native American descent. So, so I think we um, at least can be made curious about not only what we are not learning about history, but how it affects us right now. Um, for instance, I, I, if, if we knew our history, then Rush Limbaugh could not get away with saying feminazi. Uh, you know, that comes from the idea that somehow, um, I think it originally came from the uh, anti-abortion movement because they were trying to equate fetuses with uh, Jews, which was a little anti-Semitic in itself, <laughs> but anyway. It, it, so he has for all these years been saying feminazis. So I thought I would read to you what um, a few quotes from Hitler, who happens to have been wildly anti-abortion. The first thing that he did when he came to power, and he was elected, don't forget, on a low voter turnout, he was elected, uh, uh, by families, by very patriarchal families who had come to deeply believe that you had to have a strong male authority, that that, that had become normalized, you know, so he was, he was elected. The first thing that he did, or among the first things, was to padlock the family planning clinics and declare abortion to be a crime against the state. And in Mein Kampf, Hitler says, we must do away with the conception that the treatment of the body is the affair of every individual. The right of personal freedom recedes before the duty to preserve the race. Uh, it was and is the Jews who brought Negroes into the Rhineland. Incidentally, there were a lot of people of African descent living in Germany at the time, ruining the hated white race by the necessarily resulting bastardization. As the British historian Tim Mason points out, anti-feminism was not a minor or opportunistic component of national socialism, but a central part of it. The whole idea that women were the means of production owned by men, uh, that women could have no say-so over their own sexuality or reproduction, was deeply, deeply embedded in his philosophy. Indeed, he even imported a wonderful woman, a, a kind of Phyllis Schlafly person from England named Lady Griselda Cheap, C-H-E-A-P-E. -E. You can't make this stuff up. Anyway, <laughs> who... <laughs> Uh, to, as an anti-feminist spokeswoman and sent her all over Germany because this, he, the National Socialism was a backlash against the success of the feminist movement and the gay and lesbian movement. The, there were more women in the Reichstag than in any parliament in the world. There was a huge feminist movement uh, and there was a huge uh, sexual liberation movement and uh, Jews were well integrated into society. He, he, he was a right-wing backlash against all of that. Um, and in 1933, feminists were removed by law from teaching and other public posts. It was the very same law that removed all non-Aryans from such jobs. All women were banned from the Reichstag or parliament from judgeships and other decision-making posts. And what were the... Um, uh, German feminists saying, they said, the competence of the modern state is limited by preserving the reproductive freedom of the individual over his or her own body. Does that sound familiar? Think I should send this to Rush Limbaugh? You think there's any hope? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if we don't know our history, we are vulnerable to great, um, our, really our history, not just their history, our history, were vulnerable to uh, great um, distortions uh, and propaganda in, in, in the present. Um, and, and so let's think about what we're reading now. And are we getting the whole story, which hopefully we are getting more of. But um, 
For instance, I recently saw a story about emergency rooms, since, of course, in this financial climate, emergency rooms become the last resort for people who have lost their health care or who never had health care and so on. And it's becoming much, much worse. The, um, the use of emergency rooms is now uh, way beyond their ability to respond. The average waiting time is something like three or four hours, no matter what's happening to you. So wouldn't, wouldn't it help us somewhat to know that half of the women who are going to emergency rooms uh, have been hurt by their intimate partners. If we ended or diminished domestic violence, that, but that's not part of the story. We're still only getting part of the story. Um, it would um, help us, I think, when we talk about uh, Childcare and this being the only modern democracy in the world without some national system of childcare. I mean, we are getting this story sometimes, although not necessarily with comparisons to the rest of, of the country and how very far, or the world, how very far behind we are. But we're not seeing what it's doing to girls because girls are getting an unfair degree of the responsibility of caring for their younger siblings. And what that means is that they are being penalized in their own freedom and education doubly, both as young people and children themselves and as the caregivers for other young children. Um, we um, have, of course, as you know, the highest rate of unwanted teenage pregnancy uh, in the world uh, of, of any, you know, modern country at all. And uh, I think Lubbock is right up there in uh, <laughs> contributing to this in terms of national uh, statistics. Uh, and that, okay, we know that, but do we know there's just a report saying that ch a child in this country is abused every 10 seconds? Those things are connected. Those things are connected. How is it that we can pretend that sex education is the only subject to be valued by the absence of knowledge, not the presence. You know, sexuality is a part of life. The, we, we are told by uh, various groups here that sexuality is only moral and okay if it takes place inside patriarchal marriage and is directed towards having children and we would all protect their right to make that to live in that way fine you know we all have choices but that happens to be a lie about human sexuality human beings are the only of course at this point I always worry about am I maligning other animals but I think that <laughs> <laughs> human beings are the uh, the animals, the only animals that don't have periods of heat or estrus in which sexuality is, and sexual desire is focused. We uniquely experience sexual pleasure equally whether we can conceive or not. It's a mark of our humanity, like our cerebral cortex or our ability to reason and remember, that for human beings, sexuality is not only a way we procreate if we choose to, but also a way we communicate, a way we reach out to each other and express love and caring. And if we understand that and understand the difference in the two points of view, that is, it's only moral and okay if it's inside marriage and directed towards having children versus for human beings uniquely, it's also a means of communication. You can understand why the, um, there is opposition to some things that otherwise don't seem logical. I mean, on campuses, people will sometimes say to me, so why are the same groups against lesbianism and birth control? <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense. From their point of view, it makes sense because they're against any sexual expression that doesn't end in conception and doesn't take place. And so 
naturally they're against sex between two women or between two men because it stands for communication as opposed to to procreation. It makes sense. Sometimes people say to me, well, why is there such a correlation between people who are anti-abortion and people who support the death penalty? It makes sense from their point of view because the question is not the what, but the who, who controls it. As long as the state or the tribe or the church or the, makes the decision, it's okay. What's subversive is if the individual can make the decision between life and death, so to speak, that is between giving birth or not giving birth. And you know, if you think about what we're doing as women, we're seizing control of the means of reproduction. It even sounds radical, doesn't it? <laughs> and it is. And it is the only way that we are going to um, achieve an equal society because if you can't control your body from the skin in, you can't control your life from the skin out. It's not reproductive freedom as a fundamental human right, as basic as freedom of speech or assembly or religion, uh, is, 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 fun, is not a single issue. Although, actually, I think a single issue is any issue, not one's own anyway. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> but it's not a single issue because it affects everything. Whether or not a woman can decide when and whether to have children, to have and not to have children, is the biggest determinant of whether she's educated or not, whether she's healthy or not, whether she's poor or not, what her life expectancy, I mean, it, you know, it, it's our bodies, it, it affects everything. And so what we think of as sweetly reasonable, which is that we should be able to decide what happens to our own bodies, actually is, is a, a fundamental uh, component of really of democracy and I think that's what we're beginning to realize you know that you you can't have you can't have democracy without feminism it, even even if it weren't for the sake of female human beings if you think about a, um, a family that is hierarchical and that says that it's natural for boys to have the education money or for um, girls to, you know, take care of the younger children or for what. If you accept that in your own family, if in the people we love the most and are closest to us, if we will accept that there's a birth-based difference that means some people get more than others, we'll accept it outside the house too. It normalizes it in the same way that domestic violence normalizes violence everywhere else in the street and in foreign policy. Sometimes I think we should not call it domestic violence. It makes it sound small. You know, we should call it original violence because it is the root of everything. Uh, as the Irish peace women demonstrated and as the women in Liberia, you know, so many women have shown that violence in the home is what normalizes violence everywhere else. Now, this leads us to a problem of genderization that is a little more subtle uh, because the question is why we don't learn that violence in the home is what normalizes violence in public life and so on. And that's because uh, ac areas of academic study themselves get genderized. The question of family forms and child rearing is a kind of feminine area even though there are many important uh, men in it too, but it's kind of feminine, right? And the study of foreign policy and um, government and so on is a kind of masculine area. And the result of this is that I have yet to find a course on any campus that explains that if you don't have a demo democratic families, it's going to be very hard to have a democratic society. That the, um, the ways that the children are raised are very often replicated. I mean, there's a reason why all the great, all the big dictators I know of, Stalin, you know, every, every one of them, um, was a victim of child abuse, sadistic long-term child abuse. And so got no help to get out of it and repeated it. You know, we, we, this linkage between what happens in our early life 
and what we do in later life is not being properly made because the areas of study are, are still genderized. Um, but of all these uh, areas, I think, all these things we are missing, you know, in terms of learning our history, figuring out the, the, the real story that we are reading in our newspapers every day, truly the most intimate thing is that we are missing the rest of ourselves. Uh, it's um, the full circle of human qualities that each of us has. So for women, it may be learning to be, to deal with conflict, to be assertive, to be daring, all these qualities that are wrongly called masculine. For men, it may be learning to be expressive, creative, empathetic, all these qualities that are wrongly called feminine. It, we may be progressing in different directions in order to learn, but the fact is we, are, we have the same goal, women and men, which is to complete ourselves, to learn all of our human qualities that we share with everyone else, but in a unique way. And I think, too, um, while these roles make women lead narrower lives and feel guilty and take blame onto ourselves, and um, though we're only halfway, as I was saying, into the, the second wave, we're only halfway there. So we have, yes, we have realized that women can do what men can do. This is good. I, most of the country knows that. But we haven't realized that men can do what women can do. So many women have two jobs, one inside the home and one outside the home. And children are deprived of their fathers, of knowing that men can be as, as loving and nurturing. It's a libel on men to say that it's not true. Of course men can be as loving and nurturing. So, but until men are equal in the home, women can't be equal outside the home. It's not to mention that we need a national system of childcare and so on, but we not only can women not be equal, but children will continue to grow up with the idea that um, if they're men, they can't, if they're boys, they can't be loving and nurturing. You know, they have to be, uh, conceal emotion and be in control and so on. And if they're girls, they have to. Uh, be subservient and assert. We'll just go on replicating these terrible roles that, that restrict us all. So yes, women lead, lead narrower lives because of the roles, but men lead, sh lead shorter lives. Uh, it, we, we figured out once by looking at the actuarial tables that if you, did, if you took from um, the statistics on the cause of death, you know, men still live about seven or eight years less long on the average than females in this country. Uh, but if you deduct the deaths attributable to the masculine role, deaths from violence, from guns, from speeding, from tension-related diseases, uh, it, men live about four years longer. So, you know, this movement has four years of extra life to <laughs> offer you. This is not a bad offer, right? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I think we will begin to eliminate this idea of human hierarchy that once it is normalized by males and females, then makes it okay for race, for class, for ethnicity, for all of the other things, and that is reinforced by uh, racism, since if you want to maintain racism, you have to keep a certain amount of racial purity, quote-unquote, and that means you have to restrict the freedom of women even more. So I hope now we understand these two things go together and there's no such thing as being a feminist without also being an anti-racist and there's no such thing with, uh, as being an advocate of racial equality without also being, being a feminist. So um, I think w we can see both where we've been and where we, and the enormity of, of what's left to do uh, and the excitement of doing it, and the community we find in doing it, 
And the, the, the remaining adversary is just, I think, the feeling that somehow we don't have the power, that we can't, we have to, st only somebody at the top can do it. I don't know how we got this idea because revolutions like houses are not built from the top down. They're built from the bottom up. It matters <laughs> what, what we do. And the art of behaving ethically or morally is behaving as if and effectively is behaving as if everything we do matters. Because we don't know which thing that we do is going to matter anyway, right? So it's the words we use with each other, it's what we do every day, uh, it's understanding that them what eats can also cook, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, you know, expecting uh, male as well as female human beings to pick up um, I, there was a wonderful woman who, s who said to me once in an audience like this that her, her she, in a discussion, she was saying, well, you know, her husband didn't even pick up his underwear off the floor, and I really didn't know what to say exactly because I'm not in that situation. <laughs> and so, so another very shy-looking woman got up on the other side of the room and said, well, when my husband leaves his underwear on the floor, I find it quite useful to nail it to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so I look forward to our discussion. I'm sure there'll be all kinds of. <laughs> but uh, it, it, so I, I used to kind of, and I, fe I fell in love with an image of uh, the physicist who said that a butterfly's wing can change the weather th uh, hundreds of miles away. You know, because I thought that proved that everything we do matters. Right? And so I used to end with that sometimes. But then, hopeaholic that I am, even I began to think it sounded a little saccharine. <laughs> so so I, I, I decided I would learn about butterflies. And I discovered that what really happens is that the caterpillar has within its body imaginal cells. It's not a lovely word. Imaginal cells, that's what they're really called, imaginal cells. These cells are activated or activate themselves and are resisted by the caterpillar's body because it has its form. And it is the energy released by that process of change on both sides that turns the caterpillar's body into a gelatinous mass. And that feeds the cells and allows the... Um, butterfly to be born. It's a much more realistic image, don't you think, of how change happens and not, not to be afraid of, of, of the energy released by the coming together of, of different forces and different ideas because it releases a, a creative energy. So I just want to say today here in Lubbock that it seems to me that this room is full of imaginal cells. And you are going to make a butterfly that is going to change the weather <laughs> completely in this day. <laughs> Thank you.